Good evening, everyone. As people are still coming in, my name is John Treat, and I'm the Director of Interdisciplinary and Curricular Learning at the University of Arkansas Honors College. And on behalf of Linda Kuhn, our Dean, I want to welcome you all to our much anticipated second lecture in our public preview series this fall, showcasing the signature seminars that we will be teaching in the spring. And tonight we have a special treat in that our topic is death and art with distinguished professor of art history, Lynn Jacobs. And I introduce a lot of people, but it's always terrible when you know just enough about someone to understand how distinguished they actually are and try to do them justice. And that is the case tonight. Professor Jacobs holds a BA from Princeton University, a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. She began her career, her first position as a professor at Vanderbilt University, where she was an assistant professor and an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow before coming to the University of Arkansas, where she has had an exceptionally distinguished career. She is the author of four books, her two first books on Netherlands triptychs from Cambridge University Press, and um, her third book, Thresholds and Boundaries on Liminality in Netherlandish Art. Her most recent published book is The Painted Triptychs of 15th Century Germany, Case Studies of Blurred Boundaries, and these are all gorgeous books. If you are interested in art books, these are all where book editors believe that they go to art book houses if they're good when they die. And Professor Jacobs has produced gorgeous works with texts that illuminate um, the pieces she discusses for a wide audience in beautiful and clear language. She is currently working on her fifth book, on Hieronymus Bosch's Images of Hell, which was the subject of her Honors College Mike lecture a couple of years ago. She is, as I have already said, a distinguished professor at the University of Arkansas. For our audience tonight, she is the supervisor of many honors theses. She is a mainstay of the School of Art and someone we are incredibly lucky to have as a colleague and a supporter of the Honors College. So I will turn things over to Professor Jacobs to discuss her upcoming signature seminar for spring 2023, Death and Art. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Treat, uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my lecture tonight um, is designed to be, as it's supposed to be, a sneak preview of my signature seminar for spring, Death and Art, uh, for those who are interested in taking the course. But I know that there are some folks here tonight who might not be you know, planning to take the course or interested in taking the course, who are here maybe just to be nice to me, and that's great, but also maybe just interested in hearing more about um, the relation between art and death in the Middle Ages and early modern period. And so um, you'll be learning about that and seeing some, hopefully you'll find fascinating artworks. Um, and um, for those of you who might not be planning to take the course, if there's more you'd like to learn about it, um, if you're not going to be taking the course, I'd be happy to make some suggestions about readings and things that uh, you might want to look into more. Um, and I'd be happy to, uh, to give some suggestions to you at the end of tonight's lecture. So let me see if I can share my screen. Hopefully I'll be able to do that. OK, let's see. Here we go. So uh, my seminar will be this coming spring titled Death and Art. And uh, I'll start out by talking why the topic, when and where. So everybody's seeing that okay? Otherwise scream, not. So we are, Typically, thinking of art as something that's on display 
in museums and galleries, um, something that's just for the elite or sophisticated purposes. This is a picture that's of uh, a trip one of my classes took to see masterpieces at the mat. Uh, let me see, actually, if I can raise it okay if I hide the, these controls. Is everyone okay with that? Um, so you can see this a little better. Um, that my class took, uh, my class on uh, Dutch genre painting took to see masterpieces of Dutch art at the Met. And that's what we're used to thinking of art as uh, just something you might go to the museum to see uh, or a gallery to see. But in pre-modern times, art really played a critical role in relation to the rituals of death. Here on the left, we're seeing a funeral service in front of an altarpiece. And here on the right, we see a sculpture of a corpse that's in connection with a tomb. I'll talk a little bit later on about uh, cadaver tombs that were very popular uh, in um, the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries in some areas of Northern Europe. And in pre-modern times, art was really closely linked to the fate of your soul after death. And so, my course, Death and Art, represents something I've been harping on since I came to the University of Arkansas, and I try to harp on in all my courses, this idea that it represents a case study about the power of art. And one of the things that, you know, in our times and in our country, we tend to think of art and artists as something that's not very important. But in earlier times in Western culture and in other cultures, there's a lot more understanding of the value and power of art. And so one of the reasons behind this course is I hope it really illustrates the power and importance of art. How much more important can art be if it's tied up to the fate of your soul after death? Hold on, something bad has happened. Uh-oh. Hold on, something really bad has happened. Let's see if I can get out of this. Not sure what's happened. This has never happened before. Okay. There we go. So, in terms of when and where, this class is going to look at art of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, mainly in Northern Europe, with a bit of Italy thrown in. Uh, I just couldn't resist one monument. Because this was the time when the links between art and death were particularly strong and the imagery of death was particularly inventive. On the left here, we have a scene of a legend that was very popular in the Middle Ages, the legend of the Grateful Dead. It's a story about uh, a knight who was very um, diligent in praying for the dead. And so one day when he happened to be riding his horse through a cemetery, he started to be attacked by some guys. Uh, and you see these guys over here, an army here came and attacked him. But the dead, because he had been so good at praying for the dead, the dead rose out of their graves and they protected him from the armies. And the inscription here at the bottom, it comes from the 23rd Psalm, um, the line from the 23rd Psalm in Latin, though I walk through the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We're used to thinking that it's God who's with you. But in this case, it's the dead who are with this guy, the grateful dad, the grateful to him because he prayed for their souls. And so in this period, there's this really great, this strong connection between the living and the dead is a very important issue that we're going to be probing in this course. I'm going to look at some facts in our period. In pre-modern times, uh, although sometimes people seem to sort of say, oh yeah, yeah, Early modern times, you know, the death rate was much higher. Obviously, the death rate is the same as it is in our own times. It is the death rate was still 100%. Everyone uh, does end up dying. Um, but the average lifespan was around 35 or maybe in the 40 to 50 range, depending on how you think about it, um, because uh, there was a huge rate of childhood death and about half of all children died before the age of 16. 
if you did survive childhood, you had about a 50% chance of living to the age of 50 to 55. There was also a huge maternal death rate. So giving birth was a very dangerous thing. We also have in the um, mid 14th century, right at mid century, the famous Black Death or bubonic plague, which killed about one third to one half of the population of Europe. And we often think that it just happened in 1348, but actually there were continued outbreaks in the 15th and 16th centuries. There were continued outbreaks of the Black Death, uh, which uh, continued to cause a, a lot of population uh, death. And then there was also very poor medical care and treatments in this period. So the bottom line, it was very quite possible at this time to wake up perfectly healthy and be dead by evening. So, so death was sort of a uh, you know, real threat uh, at all times. This image here from a book of hours shows uh, a, a burial in a churchyard here. Uh, and dying um, in pre-modern times was really not the same as it occurs now. Uh, it was much more visible um, you would die at home, typically. They didn't have any palliative drugs to, to make it less painful. You're typically your family and friends watched you as you die. And unlike now when death occurs in hospitals, typically in sanitized ways, and many are shielded from the sight of death and dying, it, it, was, it was much less so, or even now we have a hospice, uh, but the hospice has lots of ways to make you die more comfortably at home. This this did not happen at this this in this way. Erasmus, the famous 16th century humanist writer, wrote, "From our childhood, what else do we hear but the groans of the dying? What else do we see but the dead being carried out for burial, the procession of mourners, and the monuments and epitaphs for the dead?" This scene here, also from a medieval manuscript, shows a man dying. Uh, a candle, which was typically part of the funeral rites, uh, the death rites, he's put his hand. Here is a physician with a flask of his urine. Uh, looking at it here, and here is probably a priest with some of the implements to administer the last rites. A nun here uh, is praying for him. And we think uh, here are some, uh, perhaps some relatives, or sort of a sort of dandy here. We think this is probably his heir. Down here at the bottom, we see the heir again, and he looks like he's going through the treasure chest, either before or after this man has died, or trying to see what he's going to inherit down here. Now, a lot of the period that we're going to look at in this course, although we will look at some art that occurs uh, after the Reformation, but a lot of the period that we'll be looking at uh, will be studying Catholic, medieval Catholic beliefs. And we'll be looking at the, what their beliefs about what happens to you after you die. And around 12, the 1200s, this is the picture of what was believed uh, happened to you. Now, in very early Christianity, they were thinking that the last judgment and the end times were gonna come very, very soon, but it became clear that this wasn't happening. So this new picture occurred that after death, each person would experience particular judgment or personal judgment, and that was going to happen before end times and before the last judgment, which would happen at the very end of time. So personal or particular judgment would decide sort of on a temporary basis if you would go to heaven, hell, purgatory, or limbo. So these are these. this is the first kind of your first judgment. Limbo was for unbaptized souls, which is why Catholics wanted to get the children immediately baptized after they were born, because they did not want uh, anyone to go to limbo. And after, once you got to limbo, you know, that was it. That was the end of it. Um, now, most Catholics expected to go to purgatory, where they would undergo thousands of years or what would feel like thousands of years of hell-like torments to work off venial, that is forgivable sins. 
If you had committed mortal sins, you would go directly to hell and that would be forever. That would be eternal. The possibility of going to hell was pretty real. There was one account of hell which describes the tortures of those whose sin was, and that was considered a mortal sin, at least according to this description, that they had sex on Sunday. Really, only it was believed that saints went directly to heaven because those would be people who were without sin. Um, you just basically had to be a saint to do that. But most people felt that, you know, they were probably going to go. They had sins to atone for. They hadn't done any mortal sins. They were going to go to purgatory. And they were in purgatory. It was going to be like hell, but they would work out their sins. They would get really tormented. But after they had worked them all out, they would be able to go to heaven. Now, the last judgment would occur at the end of time. And then there'd be at that time, the souls would be reunited with their bodies and the final permanent division would between heaven and hell would be established. Um, and the souls already in hell were gonna stay, go back to hell. Everyone would be reunited with their bodies. It'd be the last judgment. The souls already in hell would go to hell and people have been in purgatory and they worked off their sins would, would get to go to heaven at that time. And so the real issue was people were thinking about was you know, how to shorten their time in purgatory. And that was really the key issue that people were wrestling with. So, and also avoiding hell. So how to avoid hell and purgatory, which was really just as bad as hell, but, but temporary. Of course, it could feel like thousands of years and it could be thousands of years. While you were alive, you needed to do good deeds. And there were lots of ways to good deeds you could do, but donating works of art to the church was a good deed as well as other acts of charity. Saying indulgence prayers. Indulgences were literally time off from purgatory. And so certain prayers were indulgenced. If you said those prayers, you would get time off from purgatory. And indulgence, uh, and oftentimes these prayers were linked to images that were themselves indulgenced. So if you said a prayer in front of an indulgenced image, you got time off from purgatory. Now, indulgences really sprang up and became a big thing in the later Middle Ages. And around 1500, there was a real inflation of indulgences. Now we're living through a time of inflation and around 1500 was a big time for the inflation of indulgences. So, you know, in the early years, as you said, this prayer, you might get a hundred years off purgatory, but by the 1500, you could get thousands of years off of purgatory for saying just one prayer. So it was a really good deal. And when it was linked to images and those images became super popular. And then you could have masses said in your memory. So you could find masses to be said for you and to be said for you after you were dead. And that would all help to get you off time of memory. And of course, masses were said in front of altar pieces, which were images too. And then after you were dead, and as long as you weren't in hell and you were in purgatory, you would pay to get or, or get living people to do tasks one and three often your, your kids or your other relatives who are still alive to do all that stuff for the benefit of your souls. And artworks around to remind them to do this was a really good thing. So the bottom line was art played a very key role for your fate after death and for getting you out of purgatory. And here, this image also from a manuscript shows what could be going on to you for you while you were in purgatory. This is an image of hell, but Purgatory is just like it. You can see the devils are having a wonderful time, roasting you on fires, cutting you up with butcher knife, beating on you, putting you in boiling oil. So you definitely wanted to cut down the amount of time that you were gonna undergo all this stuff. Here's an indulgenced prayer. This is a print with a prayer to Mary in the sun, which has Mary in the sun, the image, and then a prayer in Dutch. Um, and this prayer, it says, was net you 11,000 years off of purgatory. And this particular indulgence was granted by Pope Sixtus IV, who became Pope in 1471. 
And while it was expected that there would be fears of death in all cultures, late medieval and early modern culture between the 15th and 16th century seems to have special dread of mortality. Erasmus wrote, many are tortured by the thought of death. People shrink in fear at the thought of physical death. One of his most popular works by Erasmus was on preparing for death. The macabre one of the, is one of the major phenomena that we see in late medieval Northern Europe. It, when we talk about the macabre, we're talking about a rather disturbing and horrifying involvement with death, which some have associated with the anxiety associated with the change from medieval into early modernity. Some have seen the macabre as a kind of negative mirror image of the redemptive body of Christ as a positive means of salvation. In this period, there's a tremendous focus on the body of Christ and the idea of Christ suffering as a means of salvation. And then this horrifying figure of the skeleton of death being that sort of negative reverse of this horrifying body uh, as, as a negative image of death. Some have seen it, the macabre as a response to the demographic disaster of the Black Death. There's a lot of discussion. It's hard to fully pin down the reasons for it, but we see a lot of art which obsesses over the gruesome side of death. We see this in this image of this horrible skeleton of death coming and biting, and in other words, killing this image of this uh, naked, uh, woman, this is the theme of death and the maiden, uh, a very popular macabre subject matter in this period, which combines uh, death and sex, which is another aspect of the macabre that's very popular in this period. So I want to move on now to talk about death and art. Why me? Why, why am I interested in this subject matter. And here I am uh, doing uh, one of the uh, fun things that art historians like to do, climbing on ladders, looking at altar pieces, trying not to fall off while taking notes and uh, studying uh, medieval art. Um, my research in art history is kind of then a long, decades-long path that's led me to this interest. And I'll briefly go through uh, sort of the path that I took to get here. My dissertation uh, was a study of Netherlandish carved altar pieces. These are very large works of art. They're altar pieces, which are the works of art that are placed on altars and the mass uh, is celebrated in front of them. These works were produced in present-day Belgium, um, uh, made in Brussels and Antwerp largely in the 15th and 16th century, and they were export, huge export items. This particular work was exported um, to Norway, and um, I was working on these for my dissertation. They were pretty obscure works of art when I was studying them. This work um, has uh, various saints in the wings here. And then it has some scenes of the Virgin here, the Virgin and the Sun, that's an indulgenced image, by the way, and the genealogy of the Virgin, the Virgin's parents, and then the Virgin and Child coming out of it here. We have um, the scene of the Adoration of the Magi, the Three Kings here, and then um, uh, this is... Um, I'm oh, sorry, this is the nativity here, and this is the Adoration of the Magi here. And then we have three scenes of... Uh, of relating to Christ, the crucifixion. And this is the so-called throne of mercy, God the Father presenting the dead body of his son. It's a trinity here, the doves here. And then Christ is the man of sorrows, Christ holding up his wounds. There's a last judgment down here. And then two saints on the side. And I was working on these works of art, um, altarpieces. They have wings here, they're hinges. They close up and there's paintings on the outside. And I got really interested in a lot of different things about them. But one of the things I got interested in is about all these parts, all these relations between these parts. It's like this three ring circus. I started to think about you know, how do the wings relate to the center? This part folds up. There's paintings, there's sculpture, there's architectural de decoration. How does this all interrelate? How does this become a visual unity? Most people were considering 
the outside separately from the inside? How do all of the this the parts, the separate parts, how do they relate and how do they interrelate as a unity? I started to think about the relations between the different parts and how do all of the um, what's the relation between the inside and the outside and how do we how do things go relate across the different divisions between these works and this started me thinking about thresholds and boundaries across the altarpiece and little did I know this was going to get me into a whole kettle of fish but then I started to think about painted triptychs that were produced in the Netherlands region of present-day Belgium. In some other works, uh, the uh, a painted triptych and panels, painted panels that also fold up, this famous Marode triptych this is in the Cloisters in New York. If you ever get a chance to get up there, it's a great place to visit. This is probably their star painting. This work shows the Annunciation in the center, the angel Gabriel telling the Virgin Mary that she's pregnant with the Christ child in the center. On this wing here, as we call it, the side of the triptych, Joseph is working as a carpenter, which was his occupation. And the format of triptych is kind of nice here because, you know, we know that Joseph wasn't the father. And so he's separated off here. He's on a whole separate panel. So it's clear he had nothing to do with this. He's not the father. The format contributes to this, this notion that he's separate. And on this wing, we have the so-called donor. This is the guy who paid for this work of art. And it becomes common in these triptychs to put the donor on one panel. This is his wife here. He's kneeling outside the chamber of the Annunciation in prayer to the Virgin, but he's in a separate space. He's outside of the scene. He's separated from it. But I kind of got obsessed with his positioning here on this wing and the idea that there's an open door here that he's sort of facing, and that seems to be a door into the chamber of the Annunciation scene here. He seems to be able to kind of look into the room, and there seems to be a door open between his space and this space. And what kind of interested me was, I'm thinking about the relationships between these spaces, and how are they a unity, and what about this 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 boundary here? What about this threshold here? Is it open? Is it closed? Um, and I got really interested in the fact that although we call this a wing and the documents talking about triptychs, the terminology for the wing is actually the, they call it a door. So on this door of the triptych, there's a door. And then I started to notice, well, here's a door and here's the door frame. But actually the top of the door doesn't line up with the door frame. It's higher. It doesn't line up. These are pretty good painters. It seems to me they could actually line things up if they wanted to. I kind of spent a long time going, hmm, yeah, this doesn't line up. Hmm, that's weird. And then I noticed there's a there's a key in here. It's still hanging in there. Who put the key in? Who opened the door? I was like in the center in a long time thinking about that. And then I got like, hmm, this is very interesting. The door, they're connected, they're not connected. And, and it's the idea that it's the sacred space. On the one hand, it's enclosed, you, it's separated. On the other hand, it's connected. And so it's this idea that this, that the donor in a way can, can get into the room, but in a way he can't get into the room. So he's both separated and connected. So his, he's praying to the Virgin, he's praying for connection into the space, but yet he's separated from that space. And one of the things that we know from, uh, medieval devotion, the Virgin is sometimes referred to as the Porta Clausa, the closed door. It signifies her virginity. And then sometimes the Virgin, a symbol of the Virgin, is an enclosed garden. Well, he's out here, and there is a kind of garden out here. It's sort of enclosed, but then there's another open door here. So I started to think about all these ways that the Virgin's also sometimes called the gate to heaven. So she's both the closed door and open door. And I started to think about all these portals and thresholds and connections and disjunctions and I spent you know a few years thinking about that and and in the relation to the virginity of the virgin she's both a virgin yet she's also um, been uh, penetrated by the holy spirit and now she's pregnant 
and also thought about that because we also have here uh, this, the Holy Spirit entering through the window and that with little Christ child coming through. And this is how she is going to become pregnant. And one of the metaphors for how a virgin can be, become pregnant that was talked about in the Middle Ages is a metaphor of light going through glass and not breaking it. And so I came to think of this, the, the threshold here, the door here also is a metaphor for um, the virginity of the virgin and for the way in which uh, the prayers of the donor both connect into the holy space and are separated from that. So I thought about that for a few years. And then I decided, you know, I really need to think more about, you know, about thresholds more theoretically. And so I spent a while thinking studying anthropology and the wonderful professor of anthropology here, Professor Joanne Dallasera, got me reading about theories of liminality, threshold in Latin means lemon, and start, I started to read about rites of passage and how in, uh, in, in rites of passage where people change their states uh, and go through different stages of life, there are different rituals uh, and there are rituals that often get associated with thresholds in connection with passages from one stage of life to another. We might be familiar with the idea that when you get married and uh, and you, uh, your uh, husband, I don't know that people do that much, but the idea of a husband carrying his new bride over the threshold of their new home. And in many cultures and different cultures, there are different uh, stages of life that uh, often have various rituals associated with threshold rites. And I read a lot of theory of liminality. And so I started to think more about rites of passage and connections to theories of liminality and not just about you know the physical thresholds uh, as well, but other sorts of passages and rites. And that got me to thinking about the, the, the rite of passage from life into death and ways in which it was articulated in art in terms of passages. And I came to this particular manuscript where we see uh, uh, a, de uh, a man, the death uh, in the office of the dead. We see the dying man. We see also his funeral, and we see um, sort of interesting passages and passageways uh, in the artwork. Below, we have an interesting scene of death hunting the hunters. There, these guys are going out hunting but they don't realize they're going to be hunted by death and he gets all these guys. But this one hunter escapes with his prey. One guy gets away. But then when we look at the scene here, we see uh, all these interesting passageways that the artist has put into the artwork. This passageway up to the house, this one guy who looks a little bit like this guy who's escaped, but may not be the same guy. But all these got we have the margins of the manuscript, but people are entering from the margins into the center to the death uh, room uh, to join the watch, the, to be there to be present while their friend dies. And on the other side, we have the funeral mass and below the crypt. But then we also have these passageways out and on the side, this passageway past the skull and through this gateway, which almost shows, which almost seems to suggest the gate to heaven. I also then uh, started working on an interesting monument in Dijon, and this is Dijon, France, which by the way, has a lot of mustard stores if you're interested in mustard. I went to look at a very interesting remnant of a Carthesian monastery, the Chartreuse de Chaumont, which happens to be the remnants in the middle of a hospital. So it's a weird place to go, but most of the monastery was destroyed in the French Revolution. And there they have the, the remnants of a church portal. The whole monastery was built to be a, a, a necropolis, to be the burial place for the Dukes of Burgundy, for Philip the Bold. And uh, it was all there. Vildebold almost never went there, but he set up this whole monastery with 24 monks. Uh, their job was to pray incessantly for his soul and for the souls of his ancestors and his successors, 
um, so that to get them out of purgatory. And so much of the art sort of has to deal with the passage from life uh, into death on the portal of this church. Uh, we see Philip the Bold and his wife with their patron saints, and they're sort of pushing out of their spots. They're normally statues kind of stay under the baldicans, but they're all kind of pushing out of their places. They're expanding beyond their pedestals, sort of moving forward as if they're kind of going to move into the church and originally in the church, but now uh, they are moved out into the into the museum in Dijon was the tomb of Philip the Bald, where we have a kind of funeral procession below in monochrome. And then above is the effigy of Philip the Bald, where uh, we see it polychromed as if uh, he's sort of um, moving from sort of the white to the polychrome as if he's now sort of becoming coming flesh and uh, the contrast as if he's sort of being resurrected. So I worked on those kind of monuments about the passage from life into death. And I finally ended up with my current project. I can ended up out of moving through all the thresholds and ending up in hell working on Bosch's images of hell. So that's how I got to where I am with my interest in uh, studying the relation between art and death. I never figured out why this particular title animated, but somehow it did. So I wanna now talk a little bit about so the structure of the course and, and what I'll be covering in the course. So my course structure, this course is going to be in four parts. So we'll be talking first in the introduction about the rituals of death and burial and the afterlife and going in more detail than what I've done here. And then the course will talk about functions and the different kinds of functions art served in relation to death. And then some artists, we'll look at four artists whose works were especially linked to death. And then the students in the class will adopt a theme related to death on which they will work as their projects and do presentations on. So I want to talk about the functions and the main artworks that we'll be looking at uh, in relation to those functions. And uh, we will look at um, the functions of the private chapel. And I decided this was my one Italian work because I just couldn't leave this out. The private chapel, we'll look at Giotto's Arena Chapel in Padua. And this was an entire private chapel, which um, the uh, patron Enrico Scraveni, who is depicted here and is actually giving, donating this whole chapel to the Virgin Mary, John the Evangelist. Um, and it's been argued, and I think very effectively, that Enrico Scroveni um, built this chapel in part, and this is not the entire um, function of it, but a large function of this was to avoid damnation. Enrico Scroveni's father was, um, and, and most of his wealth that allowed him to build this chapel came from the practice of usury, which was a mortal sin, and Dante. Um, put Enrico Scroveni's father in the seventh circle of hell in the um, inferno uh, as a usurer um, and a mortal sin. And so this part of this chapel was part of a whole plan that Enrico Scroveni had to um, to return um, the ill-gotten gains that he had gotten from usury and try to redeem uh, himself and uh, he was buried in this chapel uh, for, and make sure he did not end up in hell for the ill-gotten gains that he'd gotten from this mortal sin of usury. And so we're talking about the function of this chapel and uh, trying to save his soul and the soul of his family and potentially his uh, ancestors uh, from um, from this uh, their sins of usury. Um, and he, this is, uh, this is located in the last judgment scene in this chapel. He's put himself on the saved side and trying to avoid this part, the um, damnation where Satan is ingesting souls and um, uh, excreting them on the bottom or birthing them on the bottom. There are different theories about this, but we'll be looking at that, the private chapel. We'll be looking at the monastery and, and we'll look more into the Chartreuse de Chamon of Philip the Ball, which I have worked on in my own research. 
We'll also look at the functions of the altarpiece. Uh, this is a Grunewald, a German painter, is an Heim altarpiece. This particular altarpiece was an altarpiece in a hospital of St. Anthony. This hospital was there to treat people who suffered from the disease of St. Anthony's fire. It's a disease of ergotism, which you got from eating um, rye, which had a fungus that was very common because they don't have preservatives and they ate a lot of rye bread. And this disease gave you horrible skin diseases. Sometimes you had to have amputations. They didn't have any cure. You could have hallucinations. And most people would come to the hospital and oftentimes die. So um, they didn't really have cures for it. Um, so this, uh, this altarpiece kind of served a function of serving people in a hospital uh, who would go to worship in front of it and often were expecting to die. So we'll talk about um, you know, that, that function of an altarpiece specifically within a hospital context and showing Christ in this horribly gruesome pockmarked skin uh, to suggest you know, his suffering was comparable to that of the people in the hospital. We'll also talk about um, the epitaph. An epitaph is a wall monument that would hang in churches above in the area of graves that would commemorate the deceased below and often would have inscriptions encouraging people to pray for the dead um, and often a portrait of the person. A lot of times these were in sculpture, but sometimes these were in paintings. This is by famous uh, painter Jan van Eyck, and it's argued that this was serving as an epitaph. It was a permanent reminder for the living to pray for the dead. And it was in this, again, in this sort of mutual relationship for the living and this living to pray for the dead with the idea that then when they were dead, you know, the next, the living would pray for them. And with this idea that this was going to, you know, benefit the, you know, the people who were dead um, and in purgatory. We'll also look at the book. Um, especially the books of ours, books of ours had the office of the dead uh, in them. Books of ours were books that were for lay people uh, and the idea, uh, not for clergy, but they were for lay people and to say prayers. And um, the idea was that they should pray the office of the dead every day to prepare for death and also for the loved ones that were in purgatory. And this has a very unusual scene of the last judgment. So this guy has died here and his soul typically is believed it comes out of their mouth. And here is his soul. It's like a little guy it comes out of your mouth and the angel and devil are fighting over uh, this guy's soul. And these little banderoles are um, communicating a little discussion that they're having. Um, the dead man is speaking Latin and he's saying, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth, which is from Psalms 30, verse 6. God is answering in French. And he's saying, for your sins, you shall do penance on judgment day. You shall be with me, which paraphrases what Christ says to the good thief on the cross in the Gospels. And of course, we have to talk about the tomb. Um, and this is what's called a transi or cadaver tomb. Um, transit means passing over and these were these double decker tombs that became very popular especially in the 15th and 16th century in England also there's some in France and they're double decker tombs in which the top tier shows the dead person as as in their clothes and sort of as living but lying down and the bottom tier shows them as um as a rotting cadaver or as a skeleton. And um, so this shows the transition from life to death within the tomb. And that's why they're called a transi tomb. And these are very kind of interesting phenomena in this type of tomb. So we'll be studying that um, when we look at tombs. And then we'll look at some artists who made um, themes of death. Um, they're, um, 
kind of uh, important themes um, in their work. Uh, Hans Balden Green is a German artist working in the early 16th century. He is particularly fa uh, famous for um, the macabre and for this blending of eroticism and death. This is his scene of Eve, the serpent, and death. And this is a really bizarre image because uh, in this work, um, Adam becomes death. And it kind of rings uh, into this notion that, um, that with the fall, um, death comes in. And we have this really weird image here where Eve is caressing the tail of the serpent, um, highly eroticized. Um, Adam, as death, is now gripping Eve here, and then the serpent is biting Adam, and Adam has turned into a figure of death. Um, we'll also see Hans Holbein, who's a um, German artist, very, also very important for imagery of death. This is two images of the same work, a little bit closer up, of Christ in the tomb. Um, very famous Dostoevsky said that this picture could rob many a man of his faith. It's one of the few images ever that we see where Christ is literally shown as a corpse and uh, um, just very arresting image. Of course, um, Holbein also famous for his image of the ambassadors. Um, this is an image, a portrait of two ambassadors from France who uh, came to England to, uh, they were ambassadors to England, and this painting was made in 1533, a really critical year was made in England. Critical year in England? It was the year that Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn and made her queen, and when Elizabeth was born, and when basically the, uh, the uh, British, uh, um, formed the Church of England and broke away from the Catholic Church. The French were still part of the Roman Catholic Church, so it was a very tense year, uh, year in terms of the relations between the French and the English. Um, this, um, for the, this was a kind of secret ambassador mission to try to see what was going on in England, what was going to happen, whether French and English relations were going to break down. So this was a, a very significant portrait. And we see these ambassadors here with these kind of instruments, scientific instruments for measuring the heavens. A lot of them are a little bit off. The measure, the, they're showing the measurements off. And then we have musical instruments and global instruments, but the lute has a broken string. So it's sort of suggesting things are a bit off in the world. And that this is famous for this weird thing here, which is uh, an anamorphosis, a perspective that's distorted, but it's showing a skull. And then up here, we have a crucifix almost hidden, um, an Easter egg, as Kyle Kellams called it. And so we have these figures of these ambassadors sort of between death and resurrection. And so these kind of very gloomy political religious events here and sort of realizing uh, that the politics of church and state, but sort of standing between sort of again, um, death and resurrection. And Hans Holbein also famous for the important uh, themes of he did a whole book of prints with the theme of the dance of death. We'll be looking at that too with the, uh, the idea that um, death as a skeleton comes and takes everybody. Uh, not exactly dancing, comes and effectively kills people. It kills each person sort of according to their profession. He comes and he stabs the knight with his lance, but the old man, he kind of plays gent and gently takes along to his, where he's, going to just walk him right into his grave. Um, it's a kind of idea that um, death will get everybody of all ages, of all ranks in life. We'll also, of course, look at Bosch, those famous scenes of hell. And we will also look at Peter Bruegel. This is his scene of the triumph of death, where we see these armies of skeletons, um, skeletons burying people, 
um, skeletons on these ships, on all these horrors that are being wreaked by these skeletons. Um, many people, uh, we have death on a horse here with a uh, carting along all these skulls here. Um, many people have associated these work with the ravages of war um, at this time, the Spanish armies are attacking the Netherlands at this time, and um, many atrocities are occurring. And um, many people are seeing, you see people here on the wheel and being hung. Um, and so many people are associating these works with a response to that. So um, each of the students in the course are going to adopt a theme. These are some samples of some of the themes that are potentially um, um, students could pick. Um, everyone will select them. We may, may develop some more as we go on and, um, 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 and students will work on the theme, their historical context, um, develop, study different artistic treatments of it and how it's related to what we've studied before in the class. And they may want to expand the time frame or even the cultural frame of it as relevant uh, for their own work on the topic. And these are some examples of some of the themes um, that they could work on. Um, the Dance of Death, which we've looked at, uh, the three living and the three dead. This is an example of it. It was a very popular theme in the in the period. There are a lot of examples of it. It's a story of three aristocrats who go out riding and they are confronted by three skeletons who give them the message, as you are, we once were, and as we are, you shall be. So they're confronted with the specter of their own death. Death and the Maiden, another subject matter, which we've already seen some examples of. Another kind of topic, the Hellmouth. The Hellmouth was one of the ways in which the entrance into hell was conceptualized. Here's an example of it from a book of hours of the mid, uh, mid 15th century. This actually is a triple Hellmouth. Well, there's the gates of hell, but here is one mouth and then inside is another mouth and inside that here the eyes, nose is the third mouth, and there is the entrance into hell, and some devils are bringing some more souls to be thrown into that. Um, another um, topic is Satan, obviously the devil could be topple, and the topic of the fall. Fall links into, obviously, the fall was seen as the origins of death, and with the fall, that brought death into the world, and that also links into the role of women and lust, because in the Middle Ages, it was believed that it was because of Adam's lust on, on um, that he was lured into um, the fall, and, um, and, and it was his sexual desire for Eve that made him participate in the fall. And so you see this in a lot of imagery of the period. This as uh, an image. So women were and women's sexuality was blamed for the fall. So we have this, uh, this kind of statue, um, ivory statue, and we, we see this very sexualized image of a woman. Um, where you know all where she was sort of clearly revealing her genitals this is, this is very eroticized for this period, and this is the front of the statue. And then when you look at the back of the statue, you see this uh, image of a skeleton just being eaten by worms and toads, and this horrifying image of of a, of a death figure that's on the backside of this sexy um, nude woman. And at the top of this image, you can see, and there's some controls here, but I hope you can see there's a seam in the middle of the skull. Um, you may know that children's skulls, um, until they're about two, there is this seam in their skull that, you know, that uh, kind of closes up. Um, in the medieval period, they believe that the seam in the skull um, actually didn't close up till they're about till, till they're about eight, but it was considered that sometimes women still had seams in their forehead um, forever. And so the fact that this seam is visible here was gender genders this skeleton as female. 
So, you know, it's sort of really meant to be a very disgusting skeleton and a very disgusting female skeleton. The idea that it's it's women, uh, women that are responsible for death and associating the skeleton with death. Some other, um, uh, Christ's death is obviously an important issue and it's such a big topic, kind of divided it up into some other uh, smaller topics. The theme of Christ's haunted infancy, which has been studied, the idea that within scenes of Christ's uh, childhood, there are references to the passion, as you can see in this adoration of the Magi, the three kings coming in, but up here we have um, a crucifix, and so there's a lot of examples of that. The study of Christ's wounds, uh, which um, also references death. Um, there's a lot of um, interesting um, material on that. Mary's death is an interesting topic because the death of Mary was often held as a really good example of a good death, and having a good death was a very good um, was considered a really important goal. Uh, in the late Middle Ages and early modern period, and Mary was considered to be a really good example and model of a good death. Um, for um, people who maybe want to move away from some religious um, topics, capital punishment, there are scenes of executions from the period um, just um, uh, for just injustice scenes, and here are some people being executed on the wheel. And so we have some imagery of that, of course. Christ's um, crucifixion is also an example of capital punishment as well. And this is a, a, a crucifixion, not of Christ, but also um, as, as a means of capital punishment. Um, there's also a, a lot of imagery of John the Baptist and the head of John the Baptist and decapitation. So if, if uh, that's another topic that's studied a lot. The Massacre of the Innocents, which as um, uh, a, a, a gospel story of um, in which Herod orders all the children to um, be murdered because he hears that with the birth of Christ that a king has been born who's going to be greater than him. But it's been studied a lot recently as a kind of early scenes of genocide. And so there's a lot of interesting uh, material uh, published on that. Uh, to be studied. But for people with more scientific interests, there is also um, some um, material that gets into the skeleton, which gets into anatomy and science. And this image here is from the work of Vesalius, a 16th century Flemish anatomist who studied bones in the Cemetery of the Innocents in Paris, which was one of the largest cemeteries. And this uh, gets into death in relation to science. And this is really scientific. And there's a lot of really good anatomical studies in this period. It's interesting is that still, this is still in the tradition also of um, thinking about reminders of death. And, and this, this skeleton is in the position of melancholy. He's, he's contemplating a memorial and contemplating a skull. And the um, inscription here uh, has. Um, has kind of references to death. One lives by genius and all the rest belongs to death, a uh, saying that was incorrectly attributed to Virgil at the time. So this is not purely scientific. It also has references to the fleeting of life, but there's a lot of stuff just about anatomy. Also, we could study the skull and the idea of the memento mori, the reminder of death, which also could take one into 17th century images of flowers and bubbles and the idea of things being fleeting. The mirror of death, the mirror, there's a lot of interesting mirror imagery, images of people looking into mirrors, hoping to see how beautiful they are and seeing an image of a skull. Um, other, um, types of subject matter. One could look at um, the suicide of Lucretia that gets into actually um, 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 classical subject matter. Suicide of Judas, which has some um, interesting um, issues. Um, it's been studied also um, in relation to kind of more um, psychologistic issues about fear of falling. 
when you think about the suicide of Judas, you can see how it gets treated very differently. This is actually a Rembrandt, so you could see how you could take some of these topics into the 17th century if you want to, versus a Cronach, uh, 16th century. And um, you can see how these uh, artists can approach these themes in different ways. Cronach uses this as a chance to just have a sexy nude uh, with a little bit of violence thrown in. Uh, whereas Rembrandt uh, takes us into a very serious study of a, a woman who was put into a, a horrifying situation where um, she saw suicide as the only way to escape from uh, the position she had been put in by being raped. So these are some of the subjects that um, um, students could adopt um, as themes that they could work on for their presentations. So this presentation, like all things, let's come to an end. But I wanted to just show you um, before I um, bring this to a close, a 17th century watch case, um, which um, is a metal watch case. You can see it, you, it's in the shape of a skull and you can lift this up and the watch would be on the inside. Um, in the 17th century, the watch, uh, this was a recent replacement for the hourglass at keeping time. And this was inscribed in different places with phrases in Latin, not all of which you can see. Um, some of the life is fleeting, despise the fallen, respect eternity, the hour of death is uncertain, somewhere on it, it's not showing up here. Um, was the image of an hourglass, which is now out of date, but it's still a reminder of death. And it's interesting that, you know, when they had you know, that within the watch, it was always this idea you must realize that, um, that uh, uh, time is fleeting and, and the watch itself was embedded within a skull as a reminder of, of death, um, this new, this new technology still within this old concept of the skull. So I would like to um, stop now and ask for any questions or comments that anyone might have. And thank you for your attention.